Right, so particularly for those at the back, the slides are already uploaded on the discourse channel, the speaker notes and artifacts channel. Also, the links up here at the beginning will be reproduced at the end as well. Um, I'm not at all offended if you've got your laptop or your phone up so you can see the slides, because I know at least half of the slides won't be visible towards the back. Also, amusingly, the first question my colleagues asked me about when this talk was, what time of day are you giving it? Is it before or after lunch? So, hi, I'm Tibbs. Um, I've been a developer for most of my life, a programmer. But at the beginning of last year, I moved into developer relations. And the nice thing about that was that all those various technologies that I'd never had time to learn properly, it suddenly became my job to find out more about and perhaps scarily give a talk about. So I work for a company called Ivan. And our aim is to be the trusted open source um, sorry, I have a look at my notes. The trusted open source data platform for everyone. And the idea is that what we're trying to do is to make open source technologies like Postgres, Kafka, um, Cassandra, Open Search, which are often a pain to manage, um, easy to use. That's where our founders came from. Why that's relevant is it because I'm in DevRel, I get to learn about Kafka. And once I've learned about Kafka, I get to tell other people about it and why it's wonderful. So we're going to talk a bit about why I'm interested in messaging and why that leads us to Apache Kafka. And I'm going to use fish and chips as an excuse to do a very simple simulation of a shop. Um, Starting with a simple model, gradually making it a little bit more complicated. There is, de as a demo, the demo code is all available online. Um, and there are some ideas for things you can do to extend the demos. I'm not going to run live demos today. I don't, never trust. Wi-Fi. Um, so I'll be swapping between my slides and recordings. I apologize for that. The source code for the demos is all in Python. It, the source code is entirely independent of um, Ivan. It, it all works with open source packages. For running and setting up the source code, for running and setting up, up Kafka and so on, of course, I work for a company that does this, so I use Ivan stuff to do that. And so the, the explanations of how to run the demos also does the same. For that, I apologize. But you don't have to use our platform to use Kafka. You can use anyone's Kafka for this purpose. So I've been in the industry for a good long time. I started out working with transfer formats where you would send a file, possibly on magnetic tape, to someone as the way you transfer data. But relatively soon, we got into sending messages. And so some of the things I've cared about in my career are sending messages between components on set-top boxes, so perhaps between the audio and video and the actual um, program information areas, configuration between microservices, again, that could be on any sort of computer, and moving stuff in to and from Internet of Things devices. So typically, you might be getting monitoring data off your Internet of Things devices. You might be sending firmware upgrades back to them. Now, between components on a set-top box, you probably want to be using something lightweight like 0MQ. Um, I was once involved in writing an inter-process uh, messaging system called KBus, which, used the Linux, which was a kernel module. Um, between microservices, well, you probably should be using some sort of state machine related thing to manage what state you're in. Um, but when you're talking about moving lots of messages at scale reliably over the internet, Kafka's a really good fit. So this is where it begins to be interesting to me. Um, traditionally, one might have been using something like RabbitMQ. Now, RabbitMQ is a wonderful product, but it's a right pain to set up. And you get a variety of problems like um, um, back pressure and things that you really don't want to have to think about. So if you don't know what back pressure is, ask me for stories afterwards. So what I want from messaging is I want to have multiple producers of messages. So this might be the IoT devices sending messages back home. I want multiple consumers, because if you've got tons of messages, it doesn't scale to just have one um, node consuming them. I'd like a good attempt at single delivery. We work with real physics. Single delivery can't be guaranteed, but I'd like a reasonable promise of it. And similarly with guaranteed delivery, I don't want to be losing messages at a reasonable level. Um, I'd like to know that if some component in the whole network crashes, everything is resumable without me having to do any great amount of work. And particularly on set-top boxes, this is a whole nightmare. Um, and as I said, I don't want back pressure handling. I don't want the queue I'm writing to to fill up and me have to say, oh, I've got to wait before I can send another message. 
So this is where Apache Kafka comes in. It's designed by, it was originally designed by LinkedIn to handle the tons of messages that you get when you are doing a distributed system that's talking with people about people information. Um, there's a paper about how um, messages and logs, moving events and static data in databases are the inverse of each other. They're two different views of the same world. And when I read that paper, my mind was exploded. And so when I actually got the ability to play with Kafka, I thought that was great fun. So some terminology. Um, Kafka has messages, they're events, so they're reporting that something has happened. Um, producers send messages, and consumers read them. You can have multiple producers, you can have multiple consumers. They are independent, they're not tied together in any way. A producer sends messages to one or more topics, and those are named, they have a, a, an ASCII string name. And a consumer reads from one or more topics, it says it which topics it wants to read from. And internally to Kafka itself, we have partitions which are used to spread the load within a topic. We'll get to that briefly later. So this is a very simple diagram. We have producers sending to a topic in Kafka, which is in the cloud, and we have a consumer. So here we've got a producer producing events, one, two, three, four, and it sends those to Kafka, and the topic holds events one, two, three, four, in the same order, and the consumer will read them out, one, two, three, four, in the same order. So we've got order preservation, which is also important to me. If we have multiple producers, one is sending one, two, three, the other is sending B, C, D, obviously they'll get interleaved in the topic, but they will still retain their ordering. The consumers, both consumers here are independent, so they will read those in the order they're in, Kafka in the, to in, in the topic, but they, they will read them independently and the order will be maintained. Sometimes that's not what you want. Sometimes you want your consumers to share the reading. So here we've got um, two topics, one with one, two, three, and one with BCD in it. Um, the producers can choose how the data goes there. You can go, you can choose which topic by hand, say I want topic one, two, three, or you can say here is a key choose by the key which topic could go to. The consumers at the top right are in the same consumer group. They said we want to share consuming the topics. Each consumer will get one or more topics, but they, but they won't both see the same topics. So one of them is seeing one, two, three, and the other is seeing BCD. The bottom consumer is not in a consumer group. It's entirely independent. It's like the previous consumers. It's just in all the messages in order. So we're going to model a fish and chip shop. Um, I have a colleague who talks about Capra in terms of pizza restaurants, but he's from Italy, so that's natural. I come from the UK, our food is greasier, and um, so we'll start with a fish and chip shop. It's not going to be a very realistic model, but it's going to be nice and simple. We're going to start with a shop that handles cod and chips, which are always ready to be served, so there's no waiting. So I probably should explain some words. So cod, which I just mentioned, is the traditional white fish that's served in English fish and chip shops. And it's dunked in batter and then shoved into hot fat until it's cooked and then taken out. Apparently, this is actually not as unhealthy as it sounds. Chips, if you're not familiar with English chips, think about French fries but kind of fatter and soggier. Place, which we'll come to later, is another fish, but it's a flat fish. And I tend to say till when perhaps I should say cash register. I think till is a more American term, but it's what I, I tend to say. So, notionally, we're serving a customer. The customer comes in. You can see the customer at the left. They go to the till. They place their order. The order gets sent by some means to the person who prepares the food. I'm afraid I'm stuck with preparer or food preparer. I could use server, which would be more natural, but then we're in the cloud infrastructure. That would get really confusing when the server talks to the server to find out what they should serve. The food preparer gathers the food out of the hot cabinet in the middle of the fish and chip shop, wraps it up, traditionally in paper, would originally have been newspaper, but that's not very sanitary, gives it to the customer. So two things there, the shop is organized as a till at the front, so there's a, a, um, a table you go up to, you pay your money. Behind that there are the servers, behind them there is a hot cabinet, and on the top there's glass panes with heated compartments in which the fish that has already been paired is sitting. And below that, there are baskets in which the chips that have already been cooked are sitting. So this is fast food. 
Behind that, there's someone who cooks stuff and puts it in the hot cabinet. So there's a nice separation of concerns there as well. Now, I'm not going to mention the customer again. The customer is that for our simulation is essentially redundant. We're not going to mention those on the diagrams again. So we've basically got a till, the order gets sent through Kafka, and the food preparer handles it. We'll assume the customer stuff is in instantaneous. So how do we represent an order? Well, we probably want to count, we're going to use JSON. So um, we probably should have an order number so we can count how many orders we've had in the day. That's going to be nice. And that keeps the order separate. Traditionally, you'd get to be given a little slip of paper with a number on it. Um, and that's your order. So you don't have to give your name or anything. And then the components of the order. So we've got one person, the person here has ordered one portion of cotton chips. That's very traditional. The other thing is that you can order just chips, or you might order a large portion of chips. Um, for simplicity, I'm representing a large portion of chips as chips twice. I'm not saying that that actually works in, in terms of scale, but it's, it's for simplicity. So now we have the first demo. Um, so I'm using a, a program that does a terminal um, user interface for the demos, and I now need to do the very clumsily switching screens. So I apologize for that. We want demo one. So on the left here, we have a till, and on the right, we have a food preparer. So the left is a consumer who's print, uh, a producer who's printing out their producing, and on the right, you can see the food preparer receiving it. Um, so what's actually happening is the food preparer is receiving the message, and then it waits for a tiny moment, and then it converts the message to have ready in it. So that's to it, simulate handing it to the customer. And you can see it's nice and simple. Stuff goes in, stuff goes out. It's a queue. This is the most awkward bit of the thing, but because I'm using PDF for my slides, I can't embed video. So the libraries we're using for this, I'm using AIO Kafka, which is a lovely Python library to talk to Kafka. It's asynchronous. It doesn't have to be, but it's got beautiful asynchronous support. To set up the topics, I'm using Kafka Python, which is an older, um, non-synchronous Python library that isn't actually particularly maintained. It hasn't been touched for some years. It still works, but as Kafka support moves on, it will lag behind the times. Um, I will hopefully at some point um, be able to use other means to manage my topics, which is all I'm using that for. To create the terminal UI, I'm using a lovely package called Textual, which is based on a, a thing called Rich, which is, um, go and investigate those separately. They're wonderful. Um, it's a lot easier than spinning up a, a web service and then having to manage those in a demo. So to actually create our stuff, we need an SSL context. We need to authorize ourselves to Kafka. Um, so we download various certificates, and we create a context. There's a nice helper in AI or Kafka to create a, a context, and then we can pass that to our producer and consumer. So here's our asynchronous producer. We specify where our server is. I don't know why it's called, well, it's bootstrap server because Kafka is multi-node. So the bootstrap server, I'm guessing, is the node you talk to first or something like that. So we have to specify host and port. We say we're using SSL. There are other options. We pass our context. And remember, we're using JSON. Kafka moves bytes around. It only understands bytes. So we need to say we want to serialize our JSON um, and shove it in, out as, as ASCII. And then we await our producer to say it started. And then we have a, a nice simple loop on um, while well, the shop is open or some other Boolean where we await sending things to the orders topic. Um, in the demos, the topics have different names, but I've kept them simple for here. To receive stuff, it's very similar. The consumer has much the same arguments. The differences are we say the topic we want to listen to at the beginning, so that's orders. And at the end, instead of having a serializer, we have a deserializer. Um, if you don't understand Lambda, just ignore that for the moment. It's just a posh way of getting your change of data in there. We wait for the consumer to start, and then we can do an async for loop, and that will just keep giving us messages as they come in, which is really nice. And traditionally, with Kafka stuff, you don't ever think much about stopping, because why would you stop? So use other techniques for deciding to stop. So we get busier. We have more customers. How do we cope with that? Well, traditionally, you'd add more tills. We've got producers. So now we've got, we're going to add three producers. And we'll add three topics, because then we can say each till will send to a separate topic. The, the food preparer is still reading from all of them, so it will get things interleaved nicely. So let's add 
a till to the JSON from before so we can keep a record of which till it's coming from. This isn't particularly useful to our food preparer, but we'll see later we might be doing auditing and things later on. So to alter the code, um, in the demo that you look at, you'll see there, there is code for creating topics. We just need to say that we want three partitions, um, and that will give us three partitions. And then we create three producers, three instances of the producer, instead of one. So this is a demo for, for that. So on the left, we'll see we've got three producers now, three tills, and on the right is one food preparer. And you will probably spot the problem quite quickly. If you look at the bottom, we're up to 13, 16, 19. The food preparer is still working on order 15. They can't keep up. We've been very cruel to our, to our person working behind the counter. Um, we're just not, we're overstressing them. So let's not do that. Instead, we need multiple consumers. So let's add one more food preparer and, uh, and see what happens. So to alter the code, well, the first of all, we just create two food preparers. However, we want them to be the same consumer group. If you remember earlier, if we want them to share the messages, we need to have a consumer group. And all we do is, when we're creating the Kafka consumer, we make sure that both of them specify the group ID as the same consumer group. And that's just a name. Uh, here it's a constant. Now, in practice, if I run the demo more than once, um, there's a chance I might have leftover things from the previous demo when I hit quit in, in the queue. And I don't, I'm not interested in those. I don't want things from the previous demo. This is not the sort of thing you'd run into a shop because at the end of the day, you shut things down and start again the next day. There's various solutions for this. Um, Kafka lets you say where you want your consumer to start from in a variety of ways, one of which is you can say seek to the end of the queue, so start at the end of the queue. Similarly, we were sending to different partitions. I've got three tills. As I said earlier, I can actually specify which partition I want it to go to. That's the bottom option. I'm saying partition till number one. I can specify um, a key out of the value field. So I could specify that's the middle option, that I want it to use till as the key and hash it and decide which partition. And the top option is let Kafka decide how to split messages between the partitions. That's changed over the years as to what that means. That's not necessarily a bad solution. Because I've got a very simple model, my model is choosing the till maps to the partition directly. I've only got three. So we now do a demo with um, our new extra preparer. So we've got, still got three tills on the left. Now, because of the way I've set things up here, it takes a little while for everyone to sort out, so I have them all wait until they're all ready. Um, but now we see that actually two food preparers is just about enough. They can actually keep up, which is good, because that saves me hiring another person. And there's only so much room in that space between the counter and, and the food cabinet. As I said, you can play with these at home later if you want. The demos are available. <laughs> now, like all good things, it's traditional to... Um, you, if you go to the code I've got for setting things up, it's all done with command line stuff. But as is traditional, there's, we have a, a web console for setting things up. Um, this is one of the few mentions of Ivan, apart from that you don't have to use Ivan at the beginning. Um, you can see, if you look at the, just next to the logo there, you can see it says nodes three. That's saying how many nodes there are, actually. So being used for Kafka. Kafka believes in redundancy, so you would not normally run Kafka with, with fewer than three nodes that all have the same data share between, in them for re reproducibility. Um, and you can see there, this is giving me the, the URI I use to connect to Kafka and so on and so forth. You'd expect to, to do... Um, introspection for anything you're doing. If you're doing things like Kafka, you will have web pages that show you information about them. You'll set them up yourself if you can't find them out of the box. So here we can see the actual names of our partitions of the topics I'm using for these, these demos and information about what's been happening with them, how many partitions each had. So you can see that demo three for cotton chips has three partitions, the others only have one. Here is 
the, a bar chart showing that of those three partitions, they've actually had the messages distributed to them between them reasonably easily, or reasonably evenly. That means my thing that's making up orders and pretending to be customers is visiting the tills reasonably randomly, which is good. But this would allow you to see, this sort of thing would allow you to say, oh, look, this partition is not actually doing anything. What's gone wrong? And here you can see, this again is showing the consumer groups that Demo3 is, is using. This is the sort of thing you'd normally set up when you're setting up your instrumentation anyway. And we have lots of metrics for, this is CPU usage, which is, I'm not sure how useful that is to know, but you can also find all the other standard things out. Um, any system of any complexity, you'll want to be setting up monitoring because otherwise you have no idea what's going on. And when something does go wrong, you want the information to lead you to where the cause might be. So, I like place. Now there are two reasons I order a place at fish and ship shops. One is I really like place, it's sweeter um, meat, meat, uh, fish. The other is place is not normally sold often enough for it to be sitting in the hot cabinet. So your place is freshly cooked. <laughs> Makes me feel special. So we need someone to cook. We need to simulate the cook. Now I'm going to go back to the very simple model where we've got one till, one food preparer, um, just for simplicity. But now we're going to introduce a cook. So when the, the idea is that when the food preparer gets an order with place in it, they can't make it up immediately. So they tell the cook, using the cook topic there in the cloud, to prepare the food. The cook cooks it, and then they send it back into the order queue into the order topic again, because it's now ready for the food preparer to give to the customer. So you've got a nice little loop there. We aren't going to try and simulate cooking or anything at this stage. So here's an order that's got place in it. The third entry there is place and chips. Our model works. But actually, I want a ready flag to say, is this order ready to be given to the customer? So in the code, the food preparer so that's the person who got the order that's come from the till. They have a new method called, is all order available? So they take the order, and if there's not a ready flag already in the order, they're going to put one in there. Um, <coughs> if all the, if, they, they, so you get all the items in the thing using ittertools.chain. If you don't know the ittertools module, go and look it up. There's some fun things in there. And then they say, we'll set order ready to be, is there place, in the, is there place not in the order? In other words, if there's not place in the order, the order's all ready. We can get it out of the hot cabinet. If there is place, we're going to need to send it to the cook. It's not ready. And then they return um, whether the order's ready or not. So they've, we've mutated the order. Bad thing to do in general. But we've also returned whether, we've also returned the value of the ready flag for convenience. So then in the second bit of code there, it, create, it, it finds out whether the order is available. And if the order is not available, it sends it to the cook topic. And so it's sending it to the cook topic with the flag ready set to false. We have a new cook who is a consumer and a producer. So they consume from the cook topic. They wait a bit to pretend to cook the thing. That's the async I don't sleep. Um, and then they mark the order as ready, which says, I've cooked it. It's ready to be served. And then they send it back to the orders topic. So now this, is, this came into the cook with the ready flag set false, and they've sent it back to the orders topic with the flag set true. And remember, the consumer looks to see if the flag's there, the, the, the food preparer. So this is a demo of, of that. I'm afraid this is one of the places where staring at the code by yourself later is often easier to, to understand what I was just on about. Somewhere in here is a demo three. Yeah. So we're back to, well, that's not, I don't want demo three, I want demo four. My apologies. This is why I couldn't find demo three, because demo four was next up. This is demo four. So we're back to, a food prepare, a food, a till at the top left, food prepare at the top right, nothing at the bottom left, it's just there to make the screen a nice size, and the cook at the bottom. So orders coming in that are ready have a tick mark, and you'll see that occasionally something comes with cod and chips. It then gets sent to the cook, the cook receives it, 
When it's ready, it says order, serve, order available, and it goes back to the food preparer. So you'll think, what you see on the food preparer is things come in with that, with it, um, and then they, some of them come out of sequence. So we've got lots going on there. But it's only the orders we're placing that have to go to the cook. Right, that's the last demo, so I can stop playing with the cursor now. So, so far we've looked at modeling the order and serving of cotton chips. We've looked at having multiple producers and consumers. And we've had a very simple order for how we do place. So that's all the demos I'm doing now. I've now got two homeworks for you if you want to go and play with the, the demo code and extend it. So the first one is we should simulate that bit in the middle where the hot food is and the fact that the cook is doing stuff. So obviously, we would use a Redis cache for that, because Redis is one of my favorite things. Postgres, Squalite, Redis, and Kafka, four of my favorite things. Um, so we'd create a Redis key store with entries for the hot cabinet. So we'd have a key for COD and how many portions are ready, a key for chip and how many portions are ready, and a key for place that would initially start at naught. Well, all, all of them are naught. The cook cooks some stuff, puts some COD and chips in. So, the preparer would compare the order it's just been given to the things in the to the counts in the hot cabinet cache. If there's enough, decrement the cache, pass the order on, it's all done. If not, send the order to the cook. The cook will wait a moment to pretend to be cooking stuff and then update the cache. So for place, they'd add as many place into the cache as were asked for. For cotton chips, they'd round up to a reasonable number so that there's a reasonable number of orders there. And then they send the order they've just been given back to the order topic and the food preparer would, would use that. So the food preparer would say, now I can make it up because I've got the order again. I don't remember having it before, but I've got the order now and now I can make it up. So this would be a really quite simple model that just brings using Redis as well and I think it would be quite fun to do. I haven't written the code for this yet. I've run out of time. Homework two is perhaps more interesting. We're keeping how many orders we have because we've got an order number. We're keeping which till things came from. We obviously somewhere have a price list. All this stuff is natural to put into a database. We can do analysis at the end of the day. We can figure out how many ingredients we're consuming, how much do we need to buy, how are we performing, are we making a profit? We need to put information into a database. So one way to do that would be to create another consumer that writes to, for instance, Postgres. We know how to do that. But that means that my Python client, the one doing that little demo for us, is now busy writing to Postgres as well. And that doesn't scale. If we actually had a truly mega-efficient chip warehouse, that wouldn't scale. So the answer is we can do that back in the, the cloud. There's a technology called Kafka Connect, which allows you to create Kafka connectors that will talk to databases for you. And you can either read from a database or other technology into Kafka, or you can have a sync which goes from Kafka to the thing. So I would do it by creating a database. Um, I'd use, I'd make sure the Kafka service had this technology enabled and then I'd set up a sync connector to send events to Postgres. I have actually already written this code, actually, in two different ways, um, and that's, that's available in the GitHub repository. It was fun. You can do it as well separately. So finally, we've done all the things done before, but we've also talked briefly about modeling the hot cabinet, which you can try later. I will probably add a demo for that as well. And we talked briefly about using Kafka Connects to share data. All of these products have registered trademarks associated with them, which I wish to acknowledge, because they're nice people. Um, if you do want to use Ivan, you can get an extra amount of credit for using Kafka there. You get a month and $400 worth of credit. That means you can actually pay with Kafka without having to set it up on your laptop. We are hiring. Um, the QR code will take you to the GitHub repository. Thank you very much.